Hi friends, I hope that you're doing well and I'm glad to have you tuned in today to the Wednesday Word. Uh, just one or two quick reminders about what's coming up. Uh, two weeks or two Sundays from now we'll be having a special event. That's the uh, first Sunday that Faith is going to be stepping into her new role as our worship pastor and pastor of young adults. And so we wanted to have just a fellowship opportunity after the service so you have a chance to get to meet her and get to know her a little bit better. So it's just going to be a covered dish meal at like 11.45, just a few minutes after the service ends on that Sunday. I hope you'll plan to be a part of that. Also, we'll be having connection class that afternoon. So if you're interested in finding out more about the church, we'd love for you to join us at four o'clock that day. Well, we're going to turn our attention now back to the word. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 where we'll pick up in verse 3 today, where Paul writes to Timothy, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. In this passage, Paul gives us three different examples that sort of model for us things that we've got to bring into the equation. If we're going to be faithful followers of Jesus who have a real impact in the world and who really help to expand and extend the kingdom here, uh, here on earth and in the region that we live in, and so he gives us a, a comparison to uh, the life of a soldier, or the life of an athlete, and the life of a farmer. And I want us to just think for a minute about the point that he's making about all three of those and use that as sort of a guide to examine what are we bringing into the equation, what level of, of commitment. And he starts by saying, be willing to suffer with me like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we know, of course, that Paul is writing this last letter to Timothy from just the most difficult circumstances. He, he's in a, just a horrible dungeon in Rome at this point. This is not when he was under house arrest. This is the second time in Rome. And it's very grim circumstances, and he truly is suffering. So it, at one level, we could look at that and go, yikes. I mean, who wants to respond to that invitation to suffer like Paul is suffering? And Paul's point was not, hey, if you really love Jesus, you're going to uh, have to find some way to live your life so that you get persecuted and get locked up. Obviously, he's not saying that, but he is making an important point when he says this to Timothy. Look, being a follower of Jesus isn't easy, and it's going to demand, first of all, that we bring a level of commitment that's willing to make sacrifices. And that's how Paul had lived his life. That's why he was able to have such a gigantic impact on so many people from so many different countries on multiple continents is he understood that being a follower of Jesus was always going to involve sacrifice. And he used the comparison of how soldiers think that way. You know, you don't become a soldier because it's such an easy life. The truth of the matter is to be a soldier it means you're going to get up early in the morning, pretty much every morning. It's going to mean that, that your life is going to get rearranged, that you're going to live in different places than what you might have otherwise chosen. It's going to mean at times that you go into dangerous situations, that you have to take risks, but this is the life of a soldier. It's a willingness to make sacrifices. And as I was thinking about that passage this week, one of the things that occurred to me that I'm so grateful for was I was reminded of my parents and uh, some of the other spiritual mentors that I had in my life, particularly when I was uh, in middle school and high school and even in my later elementary school years. And I still remember so vividly what a great job they did of, of coaching and teaching and preparing us as we were transitioning from being just children to going into middle school, going into high school and college, moving into that other phase of life. What a great job they did of preparing us for the fact that life is going to change. And if you follow Jesus faithfully through the coming years of your life, it's going to be harder and it's going to involve sacrifices. You're going to lose friends. There are going to be all kinds of activities that you wind up having to choose not to participate in because they're going to go in the wrong direction. And I can remember being perplexed by that initially. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was in elementary school, I was, uh, I was always kind of a natural leader and other kids gravitated toward me. And, and I remember just imagining that life was always going to be like that, that I would always be, you know, reasonably popular, that other kids would want to be around me. But 
I remember leaders speaking into my life and helping me to understand your friends are going to change, the people around you are going to change, circumstances are going to change, and you're going to have to make choices. And in order to follow Jesus, there are going to be a lot of times where you're going to make sacrifices. You're going to lose friends. You're going to pass up opportunities, miss out on opportunities because of your commitment to following Christ. And that got so drilled into my head. Even though at the time it didn't make sense, I remember thinking, my friends would never change like that. They would never become the kinds of people that I was hearing described. But sure enough, as we got into middle school and high school, almost all of my friends went down the path that had been described to me. Uh, suddenly alcohol and sex and just all kinds of other things became far more interesting to them than church and faith and following Christ. And so I was really shocked to see that almost none of the people who had been my friends for years continued to live in a way that was easy to really be very close to them. And I remember when I hit that phase, being shocked by their behavior and yet feeling like I was ready for this. And sure enough, I lost a lot of friends and I, I missed a lot of parties and a lot of events because I wanted to follow Jesus and I wanted to be faithful to him. There, there were a lot of things that I wouldn't do, a lot of people that I wouldn't date, a lot of places that I wouldn't go that my friends did. There were a lot of conversations and situations that I missed out on or had to walk out on. And I remember not feeling like, oh, this is so hard. This is so terrible. This is such a great sacrifice. I remember feeling like this is exactly what I was told. This is exactly what I, I had already been prepared to expect, that following Jesus involves making sacrifices. And that's not just true for middle schoolers and high schoolers. It's true at every phase of our lives that we're going to have to make sacrifices as we follow Jesus. We're, we're going to make financial sacrifices. That, that comes as a shock to a lot of people that following Jesus means I don't get to spend all of the money that I make on me. I, I have to learn to be a tither and a giver and a, and a generous person. That being a follower of Jesus means I'm going to make sacrifices with my time, going places and doing things that aren't all about me. And all of life is going to involve this. They're going to be great sacrifices. I remember in uh, in Acts when Peter and John for the first time uh, after Jesus had gone back into heaven, the very first time that they were really uh, called into account, they were arrested, they were called before the Sanhedrin, and they were punished and threatened, and, and they were so uh, intimidated or, or an attempt to intimidate them by the leadership where the implication was clear, hey, if you don't shut up, we'll do you in, we'll kill you. And, and when they finally were released, they and the church were so excited, it, the scripture says, because they had been counted worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. Jesus had obviously coached them up to the point that they were prepared. They understood. You've got to have the mindset of a soldier. This isn't some little, little kid's game. This is going to involve sacrifice. And we need to bring that same kind of commitment today that I understand it's, it wasn't free for Jesus to purchase my salvation. It's not going to be easy and free for me to be a follower of Jesus. And then the second analogy that he gives is that of an athlete. And it's easy to see the comparison between what an athlete has to do in terms of the discipline that an athlete has to bring to bear and how that compares to being a follower of Jesus. Paul said, like an athlete, you have to compete. He says an athlete has to compete according to the rules if he's going to win the prize. And we have to do the same thing. And it's just a good reminder that we have to bring discipline and self-control into the equation, that we can't just say, well, as long as I go to church and read my Bible, and, and as long as I feel good about what I'm doing, then, then it's all good. No, the Word of God sets the boundary lines for us in how we live our lives. And we've all seen so many followers of Jesus and many times Christian leaders who just completely shipwreck their lives and their ministries because they didn't operate within the boundaries. They ignored clear boundaries given in the scriptures about how we live our lives and how we do relationships. And Paul's reminding Timothy, you know what, if you step outside of certain boundary lines, you're going to do great damage to yourself and to your ministry. So you must bring a commitment to living within the boundaries. You've got to live with discipline. And then the final example that he gives is he says being a follower of Jesus is like being a, a farmer. And I don't know how many of you today have had experience on the farm, but I've had enough family members who were farmers. And I come from 
uh, family that grandparents and all were farmers. And so I've been exposed to that life enough to know, and my in-laws are, are farmers, that I, I can appreciate this about a farmer. The biggest thing that I see in the life of a farmer that translates to the Christian life is diligence. The thing about being a farmer that's so unattractive to me is that it is a 365 day a year responsibility because of what you do because of your livestock and everything else everything about farming is living things plants or animals that you've got to take care of and they require care every day of the year and so it's so hard to ever get to go away and really give your attention to other things because you always have to be attentive to what's needed there on the farm well the christian life calls for that kind of diligence too where it's, we realize it's not a part-time thing, it's not a Sunday thing, it's not just when it's convenient. If we're going to make an impact and really live for Christ, we've got to bring that kind of diligence. When I would think about um, that truth and, and just the diligence that a farmer brings into the equation and how that's needed in the Christian life, I'm reminded of the good friend that we all just said goodbye to this past Sunday as we uh, did a funeral service for Jim Richards, I I was reminded of his life and how much he modeled that kind of diligence. I can't think of anyone in the church that was more faithful to be there and to do his part than, than Jim was. Jim was, among other things, he was a member of our worship team. And a lot of times with worship teams, it'll sort of ebb and flow as far as who's committed and who's on board. And you'll see faces change frequently on a worship team because a worship team requires a great deal of commitment and preparation. You don't just show up on Sunday. It takes a lot of preparation through the week. And Jim was so faithful. His face was the one face that week in and week out, year in and year out, did not change on that stage. And the thing, one of the things that I loved and appreciated so much about Jim was the fact that he, he said many times to me and, and to Tony as our worship pastor, look, I'm not a guitar player. I, I, this is not something that's natural for me. I can play a guitar, but I really have to work at it. And I'm willing to do whatever is needed for as, as long as you need me to do it. But I don't need to be on stage. I'm just willing to do what you need me to do. So he really worked at this thing that didn't come naturally for him. He invested so much time every week and he did it for years and I just think that's a picture of diligence recognizing it's not always going to be easy it's not always going to come naturally but if I apply myself to this day in and day out week in and week out over time it's going to matter and make a difference his life mattered and made a difference just like any of us can make a difference but we can't bring that half-hearted attitude that I hear so many times from people when you ask them to serve in a particular area and the response that you get is, well, you know, I don't want you to count on me. I don't want you to rely on me. I don't want to be in charge of anything. But if you need me to just sort of fill in occasionally, I could do that. You know, you can't do much with that. You, You can't build much with that. You can't have much impact with that. It takes commitment and diligence, a willingness to, you know what, I'm going to be there each week. I'm going to I'm going to be diligent about walking with Christ every day and being in his word and being a person of prayer. I'm going to be diligent to be a part of a small group and a part of the worshiping community. I'm going to be diligent to have a role in ministry that you can count on me. Paul said you need to bring that. You need to bring the the self-sacrificing commitment of a soldier. You need to bring the discipline and self-control of an athlete who operates within the boundaries and you need to bring the diligence of a farmer. And when we do that, God gets glory and lives are truly impacted. Would you join me as we turn to the Lord together in prayer? Father, we realize that without your help and without the work of your spirit in us, we're just going to be a mess in how we live our lives. But you've called us and you've equipped us and you've put your spirit in us who's teaching us to truly be followers of Christ, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do that. Teach us to be men and women who truly are committed, who are willing to make sacrifices, and who who really are committed to operating within the boundaries, who really are diligent day in and day out. And I pray that you would help us even today to recognize where we need to, to focus. Maybe our focus needs to be that we just take on the daily responsibilities of walking with Christ. Lord, whatever it is, please help us to raise our game to the next level because, Jesus, we want to follow you faithfully. We want to live 
worthy of you. Now, Father, we thank you so much for Freedom Church and what you're doing uh, in Fairhope on the Eastern Shore and in Nigeria. We pray for your continued blessing and favor in the church. We give you thanks for what you have in store in the days ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. I hope that uh, this coming Sunday, it's Father's Day. I hope that you'll plan to be a part of worship with us then. I look forward to seeing you then at 10 o'clock. Until then, you take care.